A man walks into P.O.P. Fishing and Marine and he stands, staring and still. After a few minutes, the heavy perfection of machined metal speaks to him, and he reaches out his hand to a shiny chrome jethead trolling lure. This man owns no boat. He owns no fishing rod, no reel. But he picks up the chrome jethead fishing lure and carries it to the register, where he stands proudly. The woman at the register knows this man does not fish, but she smiles. She comes out from behind the counter, and she leads him across the store to the display of big green egg cookers. He reaches out his hand, and he lays it on the finely engineered top of an extra-large-sized big green egg. Suddenly his face gains back the faraway look of a man who has been called by something powerful, and he turns to the woman from the sales desk, and he says, I have an enormous backyard. P.O.P. Fishing and Marine. You want stuff that works? We got it. On Pier 38, next to Nico. You're listening to Go Fish with Mike Buck on AM690, The Fishing Answer. This segment is being brought to you by the Western Pacific Regional Fishery Management Council at wpcouncil.org. Now, troll on in. Yeah, as, as we continue along here, our Thanksgiving weekend, glad to have you with us no matter where you are. We're giving thanks for a lot of things, and it's, it's time to talk about the Western Pacific Regional Fishery Management Council. And one of the things that they do in, behind their little closed doors, which is kind of a secret for most of the time, is they produce copious works and reports and all kinds of stuff based on their research and observations. And we're going to talk about that a little today. We've got some of the stakeholders with us, uh, and we're going to introduce you to them one by one. But first, um, we're going to talk to Josh Jamello because I think, you know, sometimes in our regular workaday world, Josh, we... We don't realize the impact of the work we do. And I know that that's kind of true of the council in some respects because there's a lot of people listening to the show. They have no, no clue what the council's gist of the work is. It's more than just keeping track on how many tuna get caught. You guys are big. What are these annual reports? What satisfaction is there at the end of every calendar year that we come up with all these reports? Well, these annual reports actually provide a status of our fisheries, mm -hmm. and this is something that we can go to Congress or to the National Marine mm -hmm. Fisheries Service and tell them, hey, look, this is what our fisheries look like. We're going to e either need help or here's something to celebrate and yeah. um, give give something back to the fishermen so that they know what, what's going on. Is it safe to assume that a lot of this is to satisfy the fact that these organizations that you give these reports to are funding you? And what happens is they want to know they're getting banged for their bucks. So they want to see what happened in the last 12 months or 18 months or whatever it is, whatever period of time the report covers. Right. So we're, the council is funded through Congress. So this mm -hmm. is basically back, a report back to Congress saying, mm -hmm. hey, this is what's going on with our fisheries. This is where your money's being spent. But they like to get their money's worth. So they're going to be, they're going to be eyeballing this thing and say, wow, that's great. You know, that's good. We, it, we, this is a tool that was worth it. And it also provides us a way to uh, measure measure the management measures and and how how we've been doing with mm -hmm. management and mm -hmm. also to um, use as a as the data repository for some of our um, amendments when just out of curiosity because we're going to speak to every everybody that that was involved in these various reports but obviously you have to have a, a an instruction manual or a goal to set I mean you know so how is that determined I mean outside of that you have certain federal agencies that want to know let's say about how sustainable is tuna fishing in the Pacific? That's a pretty good one, right? But what about some of the other things? What, 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 what causes their need? A lot of it comes from the mandates of the Magnuson Stevens, Stevens okay. um, Act. Um, a lot of it, or the rest of it, actually comes from our fishery ecosystem plan. Mm -hmm. um, it it directs us on what what we need to uh, look at uh, as far as management measures are concerned and um, the species. But it also um, can come from other places, such as the National Marine Fishery Service, mm -hmm. on on the um, on the needs for for them to do their science as well. Okay, now let's let's get into it. First of all, Asuka Ishizaki has been with us before. Her title at the at the council is Protected Species Coordinator. And Asuka, one thing that ha there are a lot of things that happened in the last year which are kind of cool. When s we realize that some species maybe weren't as threatened as they were and then some are how, how does that shift on an annual basis is it measurable what we have to keep an eye on 
Yeah, we definitely keep a track on that, um, that what species are listed and protected under the Endangered Species Act, um, how their status is, really affects the way that our fisheries are managed, especially though the Hawaii longline fishery has heavily been managed for protected species. In yeah, fact, and that's really good because don't we set an example internationally? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah we've yeah. talked about it um, many times on this show about how great our Hawaii longline yeah. fishery is in terms of reducing seabird and sea turtle um, interactions. They are the gold standard for but you, you know what I get concerned about, and that is sometimes a fisherman or somebody listening to the show thinks, wow, you mean I can't go fish in this big part of the ocean because they're worried about this left-handed shearwater bird or something. Um, there are ramifications, right, when you identify a species as being you know, threatened or really, really in, in bad shape that you have to protect the whole area. That affects a lot of parts of the fishery. Yeah, and that's part of the job that the council has and the mm -hmm. work that we um, do with our partner at the NOAA Fisheries, making sure that all of our fisheries um, are covered under what's called the ESA, Endangered Species Act Consultations. It's a fancy way of saying, mm -hmm. oh, check to make sure your impacts are okay um, mm -hmm. so that they can go um, fishing and continue to fish. How many different species through the council, through your office, are you looking at the endangered ones? I mean, because I know that everybody can come up and they think, monk seal, they think, oh, green sea turtle, hawksbill, loggerhead. Aren't there a lot of species that we really have to manage? We do, um, especially in the longline fishery. We track sea turtle interactions, mm. seabird interactions, marine mammal interactions. In each of those categories, there's multiple species. Right, so um, there's a lot. There's, yeah, there's definitely yeah. a lot, and that's part of the reason why we pulled in a new chapter into the annual report. Um, we have a full chapter now on each of the um, annual reports um, for our uh plans um, that cover the protected species, especially the longline fishery. We have a lot of data. All of that data used to reside in multiple reports. Oh, so you yeah. have now to go to together. all different about that reports. And so now we pulled those all together. Mm. And so we have one handy uh, place to go to, to track and monitor and see what's going on. How, how many of these reports either are now available or will be available on the WPCouncil.org website? Uh, right now, um, all of our insular mm -hmm. um, reports, four of our uh, reports, so the Hawaii Archipelag Archipelagic Plan, American Samoa, the Mariana, mm -hmm. and the uh, PREA, the Pacific yeah. Remote Island Area reports, are all now up on our website. So that's for the 2015 yeah, really cool. report. Yeah. Um, the pelagic one that includes the longline fishery is forthcoming. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty close. Um, hopefully, we'll have it up um, very soon. Yeah, and Josh, isn't that something that's really... Um, Visible. I mean, when people go to the website, you know what their interest is. And, and more and more stuff is at WPCouncil.org. And I don't know, but you got to give a tip of the hat to whoever really is the main driver of maintaining that and, and, and freshening it up because it's really grown a lot in the last couple of years. Yeah, and Lauren over on our staff has been adding a lot of um, new information to the to the website and as as these reports come out it's announced on yeah. our li under the latest news category and, and by the way gang uh, we've been remiss but there's a whole bunch of our shows that are also clicked through from that website you'll be able to find even some of the pictures that are here uh so that being said marlo sabager we call him malloy is a marine ecosystem scientist and and comes from a, a different part of the world but has been here now for i guess more years than i even thought of four or five years six years six years Almost. where and for those that don't know where was home before Home is back in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's sort of interesting because I would imagine that when you were growing up, this was probably the last place you thought you were going to be living. Definitely, yeah. yeah. I, never, I never thought of leaving the country, but... You know, when, when people look at what you do, I know, for instance, for many, many years, almost everything you find in Hawaii, tourist-related or whatever was from the Philippines. I mean, just this tremendous amount of river stones and coral and all of this kind of stuff. Has the country sort of realized, okay, uh, it's great that we have all of this stuff, but we got to slow down on some of it because we're getting we're depleting? Yeah, there's there's a huge difference between Hawaii and, and, and back in the Philippines where you have a lot of people um, depending on the marine environment mm -hmm. for you know for for their li livelihoods and if you want to talk about overfishing that's yeah. where it's at yeah you know isn't it sort of interesting that here in Hawaii we used to be like that but as modern as we got we have big ships full of stuff we got airplanes full of stuff there are still parts of the world including the Philippines where if you don't fish you don't eat right so there, there you know maybe if something is supposed to be four inches and it's three and a half inches I'm sorry but I got to eat right Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what do you do? What What is your the basis of your work today? Uh, so you can explain, 
it's not just the fish, it's the whole system that the fish is in. I think a lot of us have trouble, you know, think, why can't you anchor a boat over there? It's going to ru- ruin the reef. What's so important about the reef? So there, there's, a, there's a lot of um, linkages between the health of the ecosystem and the fishery itself. Mm-hmm. So fishery is just one factor that, that affects the marine environment, especially the near shore environment. Yeah. And um, you've got uh, pollution and, you know, climate driven changes in the environment. It, isn't it sort of interesting that a lot of times the council's work is thought to be pelagic surface running game fish that are away from the islands. And that there is this working relationship that exists between state and local governments and the council. So a lot of people that say, well, I never go catch my mice. So what do I care about the council? Well, it right. gets right into the estuaries, into the the wetlands, and uh, and everything, right? Right. So, the council has this mandate to uh, manage the fisheries, or at least analyze the the status of the fisheries through the full range of its sto- um, mm-hmm. full range of the stock, which includes the near shore environment. Yeah. That's why, uh, when we do our analysis in this safe report, in- it it includes not only the pelagic realm or or the uh, from three to two hundred nautical miles, but it should also include information from mm-hmm. zero to three. So when we do our stock assessments, it, it should cover the whole the whole range of the stock. And you know, not just you're in the field federal. a lot. From what you guys do, you guys get in the field a fair bit. Um, I want the reaction of people that realize when they malama something, when they take care of it, or when they stop doing whatever was making it go downhill, how quickly Mother Nature can sometimes turn things around. Is, it, is that ultimately at the end of what your goals are to report something that may be out of line and maybe either adjudicate rules or make policies or or increase penalties or or consequences if you if you can continue to violate right it's interesting in the process of um you know compiling information for this um annual slash um stock assessment and fishery evaluation report mm-hmm. that when you look at the trends of catch cpoe and effort you would you would see some um some steep increase and decrease mm-hmm. over time and it, it's kind of interesting to look at that those, those peaks and and troughs mm-hmm that you can you can almost interpret it with some external factor affecting affecting those those trends some mm-hmm. some of which are um uh, hurricane related some of which are e- socioeconomic related kind of yeah, things i was going to ask you about that because i've seen we've talked before when i've, I've had the pleasure in the last couple of years of being the host of the um fishers forums and when you talk about these new things like effort and everything else, a whole bunch of people in the audience are thinking, what are you talking about? They're learning about these things. They're getting more sophisticated in the way you manage or, or do these stats, right? I mean, travel time is not the issue. It's what, what the effort is when you get to the fishing grounds. Explain maybe how that's changed and what a fisherman has to do to be more forthcoming with his information. Yeah, fishing effort can be defined in multiple ways, one mm-hmm. of which is... Um, Fishing effort can be um, by on a trip level. Mm-hmm. It can be num- number of hours fished or even number of gears that was de- mm-hmm. deployed. So we really have to be a specific, lot of yeah. right? A lot of variables to um, to consider, and you have we have to be specific in the way we report our fishing mm-hmm. e- effort depending on the nature of the fisheries. Like okay. for bottom fish, for mm-hmm. example, um, a lot of a lot of the bottom fish fishermen felt that trip level. Uh, fishing effort does not really represent what's going on in the fishery, ex- um, but um, that's the information that's being collected through the state data collection right. system. But what's more reflective is the number of hours that um, you know you have your hook in the water. Yeah. So that doesn't that sort of tweak the way we've been doing things to a point where the information becomes more valuable. Right. We have to be we, um, we have to be aware of those mm-hmm. nuances in the in the data set so that um, we. The information represented in the annual safe reports are truly reflective of the fishery. What are some of the things that you could share with us as far as the marine ecosystems reports that, that you've been working on this year that are now now, now finished? What have we learned? So um, the annual safe report now has a bunch of um, ecosystem considerations in mm-hmm. it. We added, um, as Asuka said, protected species. We have habitat. We have climate change mm-hmm. variables in the report. Um, and also... We have ecosystem variables in the report. We report on um, information that was collected by the Science Center on fish biomass through mm-hmm. their um, research crews, and also we have summaries of the mean length of fish that that occurs in the in the market, and also yeah. um, um, the life history variables that the life history program in the Science Center collect. So we know the age of fish, how fast they grow, at what size and age do, mm-hmm. are they um, sexually mature. So we summarize all those information in the in the report. So now we have 
all the information we need to interpret the um, the fishery performance based on the ecosystem or the environment they, they they're exposed yeah, to. Yeah, you know, Josh, let me ask you a question uh, before we move on uh, to to Becky, uh, and that is some of these things that we're talking about. Um, have a great deal of cooperation that a fisherman must do. I mean, if you show like a reef is is repairing itself because we've done this and that. One thing that Malloy just said is really of interest to me, and that is the size of the fish in different places that are being taken. You know, maybe uh, a responsible commercial fisherman on Oahu, if he gets into a school of Oama, he might think, why don't we wait until these are Becky? I don't want to eat Oama. But there are some places like in other parts of the Pacific within the council's you know, purvey that these they take and fish a lot smaller because they need them. How do these people get told you got to stop a little bit on this species, or at least at this time of the year, because if they don't breed, you're not going to be any tomorrow. It all starts with with the data. Mm-hmm. Um, what what do we know about that fish, and what do what do we expect to know? But oh. is the fisherman starting to grasp not just the importance of the data, but but buy into what the what the data is suggesting based on. It's not just somebody coming from Washington, D.C. and putting a mask in the water and saying that we have a shortage. Do they understand what yeah, do they... they get it? In other words, do they, can, they, can they use this, this information to sort of guide what they're going to catch and when they're going to catch it? For, for the most part, you probably could. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could look at, look at the data and see what, it, see what the trends are, which mm-hmm. fish seem to have a better stock. Yeah. Um, but... You have to be careful with that because you have, you also have to know what else is going on in the, in the fishery, and that's something that we're going to be working on next week and trying to interpret interpret those yeah. trends with yeah. other factors besides fishing. Yeah. Uh, by the way, that's just a teaser on next week's show when Josh and I get together and say, "Okay, we got all of these reports. Now, what do they mean?" Um, our next guest is Becky Walker. She is a fisheries analyst, um, and we're talking about habitat and marine planning. And I think that maybe this is kind of interesting because. I guess what sometimes thought of you, okay, Becky, you got to produce this report. Uh, what what is it that your reports do? What 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 have you been working on? So I'll start with habitat. Mm-hmm. Um, and for the habitat section, the council's required to define essential fish habitat for each of the managed fisheries. Mm-hmm. And so for bottom fish, there's a certain um, water column and substrate definition. So for bottom fish, it's the entire water column and the substrate out to about 400 meters. And so that entire area is considered essential habitat. Mm-hmm. And Now, what, where, where is that line between what's inshore and what's bottom fishing? You know, but they, they on the mainland they call it. They don't understand us. They call it ground fish. We call it bottom fish because usually the bottom is a little bit deeper. Well, okay. So for the habitat definition, there's mm-hmm. not an inshore offshore line because okay. we're required to define it for all life stages of the bottom fish. Okay. And so when it's larval, it's kind of floating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> floating it's, all who around. Who knows, right? It yeah. certainly doesn't know where it is. Yeah, and there, it's also defined for all of the bottom fish species. So, mm-hmm. for example, juvenile paca, they actually come pretty shallow and hang out over sandy sandy flats, mm-hmm. sandy areas. There's a spot in Kaneohe Bay that's a nursery ground just off of Kaneohe Bay. I bet people are so surprised when one way or another they catch one of them, whether it's in a net or on hooks. <laughs> wow, that's a paca. Uh, how, how, are they really, really like little fingerlings in size? Or they get bigger? Anybody know, Malloy? Well, they, they probably get bigger mm-hmm. once once they go to the adult adult habitat yeah. but for for the near shore the near shore areas they can they're probably sighted at like around i don't know maybe uh how's this like 40 yeah, 40, 40 centimeters yeah you know but but i think what's interesting is if anybody's ever caught a baby mai mai by accident they say that doesn't look it's the same color as a mai mai but it doesn't look like one is that paka identifiable can you tell it's a paka it's kind of hard yeah, to yeah. to identify what or a redfish is a redfish. Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> uh, but but that I, I think maybe Becky, that's what I'm getting at. It's it is sort of interesting to me that you know when you have a job description, and you got to go out and do something. You must be saying, okay, that's great. I love to do this, but what's going to happen to my work after it's done? <laughs> so that's something. Um so we're supposed to define the essential fish habitat Mm -hmm. and through the annual report process we're supposed to update it and so that's by in this report adding in the habitat section we're Mm -hmm. revitalizing that 
process. And so for this last report, what you can find um, available on the website is um, the beginning of a precious corals review. Mm-hmm. So that's another fishery. And, um, yeah, and that you know what? Let me interrupt for a bit because sure. people a lot of times don't get that. I grew up a black coral diver. So, I mean, I, I knew about fishing and, and coral. To me, it was the same thing. They're both coming out of the ocean. We just didn't eat the black coral. We sold it to somebody who wanted to buy it. But a lot of us are like that, right? And you see that in the fishery. One guy, he might go catch aquarium fish at certain times of the year, and he might be a mullet guy at the rest of the time of the year. So this black coral thing shouldn't be surprising that it's, it's a resource out of the ocean, right? we got to keep track of it. Yeah, mm. yeah. Or and- any precious coral, I should say. Mm -hmm. And um, the interesting thing about those is there's been a lot more, um, not a lot more studies, but a few more studies looking at the distribution of the deep water corals. Mm -hmm. And um, so for this EFH review, uh, the way that that fishery is managed, once you have a certain density of a bed, you can establish that as a bed and then put in... um, define it as essential fish habitat and estimate the harvest capacity of that yeah, I was going to ask bed. you that. Are there people sophisticated enough to say, okay, that's a bed of pink coral and we can take so much of it and it, and it grows at this rate and we can pretty much go back there if we somehow regulate. In, in, in other words, nobody wants to have a regulation or a rule, but at what point in time do they wake up and say, okay, I'll buy into that as long as everybody follows it. That's the idea of the, the yeah. Precious Corals Fishery yeah. Management Plan, estimating the growth rates as, as well as they can uh, and the density of all of the corals on the bed. Let's take a look at something that maybe people don't think about for just a minute. I don't even know if you, if you entertain this. Let's take black coral, for instance. Everybody knows it looks like a weed. You know? And Josh, let's get you on this, on this particular one. It looks like a weed, okay? But, and, and we don't eat it, but we sell it to people. Um, and... It's, it's hard to say, well, I know where some is, but what about if people all of a sudden knew, if it's really a baby, first of all, you don't get much money for it, and secondly, what purpose does it solve? It's not just there to create value in the jewelry industry. What are those, some of those, what we call precious corals, what are they good for? What do they do? And that's, that's some of the questions that we ask, we ask with our ecosystem and mm-hmm. ecological kind of questions, and for for black coral, it provides uh, habitat sometimes mm-hmm. for for smaller fish. Um, there's also other species that take over um, take over the black coral. Um, other corals like bamboo coral is usually the host for something like gold coral that yeah. grows over them. Um, so once you know what I'm getting at, once you know these things, you become a st- not just a stakeholder, but a, a part of the process. In other words, the, the more you know, the more you know. I mean, you know, you know what to take and maybe when to take it, hopefully. Well, and you, and you know, you know what size is a good size to take it at, mm-hmm. uh, both for jewelry or for yeah. or for another another curio size or something you know don't take the small ones because they don't reproduce until they're this big. And yeah, and by the time you get them back to the place and they dry them out, you can't make anything out of them. They're just too small. Right, and and you, you sometimes you, you can't even tell what it is underwater as, when, as compared to what you what it is when you finally oh, yeah. dry it the, out. The, the, the jewelry people are magic with that, but but I do know that probably Becky, it's way more than just you know this is a pink coral bed or that is a, it, it's I think that all of us and I hope that the people listening they go to wpcouncil.org and figure this out is that we really do have like a house of cards, and if any part of it gets out of whack, everything part of it gets out of whack. So what? What are some of the things that your studies would would motivate a call to action for, you know, from one year to the next? Um, well, I think for that one, I'll talk about marine planning because you were talking about mm-hmm. uh, a house of cards. So for that um, part of the report, we look at what other human what other human actions are going on in the environment that affects fisheries. Mm-hmm. And so, um, for instance, anything for what's included in the annual report is anything that. Um, as a multi-year planning horizon, like some of the military activities, mm-hmm. they'll take four years to to release a final environmental impact statement. Also, it's the, a long time. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a NEPA is a very long process, and um, the floating wind farms, the Bureau of Ocean en- Energy Management, those potential wind leases. Um, and a lot of times, in the uh, when there's an environmental impact statement published. Uh, that means that there's a significant environmental impact. And so what we've included 
where relevant is if there's something in the agency's record of decision that says this will be the impact. Mm -hmm. um, I will keep track of it in the annual report because we're required as well to look at the cumulative impact of all the fishery actions. Yeah. It sounds like it's very, very complex. And I know that, because it, it is. I mean, you know, it can't be anything more complex. We can go into outer space, we don't know about the ocean. So I, I guess that the, the light at the end of the tunnel, if you will, or the accomplishment of all of the different reports that all of you do is, gives it, it, it's like a, a brand new tool set if you learn how to use them. So how do people ramp up to that kind of thing? For instance, what you're doing now, you certainly probably weren't thinking 10 years ago that's what you were going to be doing, right? <laughs> no, I mean, what, 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 did, what expectation or what level of expectation or job accomplishment do you get out? Do you, do you expect and get out of this kind of work? Well, to me, it's really about managing the fishery mm -hmm. um, and carrying forth, carrying forth the Magnuson Stevens Act. Yeah. We're looking at adding which all is our of, mission, right? That's, yeah, that's yeah, our mission. Yeah, yeah. yeah, looking at all of these different aspects that we haven't necessarily considered as well, but as much before, or it was more difficult to access the habitat issues, the protected species issues, and climate change. Um, in light of the performance of the fishery, it it just sheds sheds more light on um, how the actual management measures are performing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, I, I think that when you, when you take a look at the big picture, once again, Josh, I got to ask you this because there's a lot of people that you know they know where you guys' office is, and they know it, you say Magnus and Stevens, they they kind of know about it. But I, I think the thing that keeps people motivated is knowing that somebody is going to react to the fruits of your labor. In other words, all of these reports, okay, we're done. Uh, we're going to start next year's, but we don't even know if everybody's going to like this year's. How, how do you measure that? How do you sort of quantify that you're getting the job done? That, that's well, always, question, been, yeah. that, that's yeah. always been the problem. Yeah. I mean, how, how do you know if, if a, the job is well done? Mm -hmm. uh, I think for us, it's always been people can still fish. We're, yeah. still, we're still fishing. We're not mm -hmm. going anywhere. We're not um, shutting down fishermen. We're not closing off areas or reducing quotas. But if we can keep that that level of fishing going that's what mm -hmm. that's what we always want to do mm -hmm. like kitty says um our model should always be fish forever yeah i love that i love that i got one of those t-shirts um asuka i want to go back to the protected species for a minute because there are some people that don't know what comprises why one of these species gets put to that list in other words what is the ideal amount let's address one that i know you know about and those are the mammals the, uh, the monk seal we've seen on the main hawaiian islands they seem to be pretty healthy and we've seen in the in the monument of papahanomoku akea that they're kind of damp they're kind of threatened um how do we use the information that we have in the main islands to go help those poor monk seals that are dying in the in the monument yeah and that's a conundrum that yeah. the monk seal conundrum as we always say why you know do they continue to um decline in a protected area and i think that's um something that the the noaa fisheries folks have mm. been trying to figure out and something that's really done under the endangered species act mm. um and not so much under um the fisheries anymore because in, from the way that we look at it we've dealt with a monk seal issue 20 mm. 30 years ago yeah. you know as soon as this co council came into play monk seal was one of the first that things that lunch, was right? dealt, dealt yeah. with and so i think we do our part in minimizing the impacts um where we can and you know continue Continue to be involved in that process and wherever the fishery can help um, to help the recovery of, of the endangered species, mm -hmm. we do. And that's what mm -hmm. we've always done with the monk seals, the, the turtles. Um, we're working on that with false killer whales okay, right now, well, too. Okay, well, as a specialist in that area, let's talk about maybe there's this big apex predator problem in that part of the ocean that seems to be, does it sometimes, it, it would seem like the planet levels itself off somewhere. In other words, if they eat a bunch of monk seals, and they ran out. They run out of eating monk seals. They're going to eat something else, or they're not going to die, or they're going to die. I mean, you know, it, it does it self manage. You know why I asked that? Because I know it's a different. I, I asked that because we have seen natural extinction of species on this planet since the beginning of time. Who knows if we backed up something that we wouldn't have a Tyrannosaurus Rex somewhere? But in fact, aren't we just 
always changing a little bit? Now you're getting into philosophy. Yeah, yeah. But I think there is certainly an environmental and oceanographic mm. component to the whole monk seal and story that we don't quite understand. And one of the things that um, we're seeing is that that decline in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands is starting to stop. Mm-hmm. And that seems to be coinciding with the big decadal 10 year every 10 year or so oceanographic shifts Mm -hmm. and so there's probably a factor of that how much of that influences food availability for the monk seals themselves how much of that you know influence food availability for the ulua and the sharks and everything else that competes with the monk seal we don't quite understand and so that's the you know the really tricky factor in that area because they get really nervous i think well now now that we're not taking them somebody else is exactly but even the the lobster thing too Mm -hmm. you know there was this big theory that um, it was the fishery that was causing the decline of the lobster and Mm. we know now that it probably wasn't and we also know now that you know lobster wasn't a big component of the monk seals diet Mm -hmm. either and so as well we continue to do studies we continue to do research um, we refine the way that we think about the ecosystem and we Mm. can refine the way that we do management and that's exactly what we do in our fisheries too and these reports really help in looking at the data on an annual basis um, encourage more research to be done to help us answer these questions, bring that back, put it back into our management, and help inform the council. And I, our, I'm our guessing. Management. I'm guessing that you guys, that this this year is like a blink of an eye, you know. And and to the people outside, oh, annual, that's plenty. We look at it annually. Well, these just they seem to, for all of us, they keep they, they're they're going by pretty quickly, right? I want to go back to uh, Marlo Sabater Malloy, is, you know, with his background in the Philippines and now doing this work here on the ecosystem. I would say that there was rampant, you know, ign- ignoring of the ecosystem for a long time in, in that part of the ocean. Um, d- is what you learned when you were there, coming here, do you see the same sort of decline or repair? How can we compare the two areas? It's, it's really about um, the difference in perspective. Mm-hmm. And um, coming from a developing country, you, you, would, you would see boats in the water like 24 7 Mm -hmm. you can almost count how many boats are out there fishing at a certain period and if you compare those numbers here the numbers here are way less Mm -hmm. and um, well look at our long line fleet there's only like 130 40 boats in it right exactly right so so you know coming coming into hawaii with that perspective with that difference in um you know in in the scale of the fishery i think helps a lot and Mm -hmm. um you know hawaii is lucky to to you know for its fishery to be almost self-regulating, yeah, um, it could be triggered by by various factors. Why it's self-regulating in in a con- in, in in a developing country, where you know a lot of people are depending on the ocean for for its sub e- even just for subsistence. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's it's very the, pr- difficult. the pressure is always yeah. high. I was going to say it must be almost impossible there to feel guilty because it's not guilty. It's this is what you do. You know, I mean, and here we can put some teeth in the laws and, and, and put some consequences on, on people that break the rules. Is that a major difference, just societal difference? Yeah, that's a, that's a major societal difference. Mm-hmm. But one thing, one thing is common um, between the two areas is that enforcement is really a huge thing that, yeah. that people are having trouble um, dealing with. And, um, well, you if know, you talk to our guys here, our, our fishing game guys, dual board guys, and everything, their their job is almost impossible. It's just so large and so big and so looming. And, and you know, how do you control from the mountaintops to the sea and one guy in the jeep, right? Right, and yeah. then you you yeah. multiply that by a hundred times if you go to a developing country. Yeah, yeah, wow, well, big deal. Um, let's go back though to also to Becky for a minute. Uh, the 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 main gist of your work this year was what. Well, this was the first year we put habitat and marine planning in the report. In the same report, right? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. the main gist was, oh, what can we, what can we start with, um, mm-hmm. with the understanding that we would iteratively improve this report over the next five or so mm-hmm. years. I would imagine, um, actually, that five years we would keep improving it after. Yeah. After five years, but um, just really getting the process in place to produce those two sections. You know, I think if if I if I just on a personal basis, I do know that when you identify something as needing a certain amount of time to probably be more valuable, it must be sort of difficult for everybody to say, I don't know if I can make 
that commitment. I don't, I'm, I'm going to get married, or I'm going to go here, or I'm going to go there, or I'm going to do these other things. Um, do you think, I think, because the, the council is a bottom-up organization, that you can easily pass along the baton? In other words, you don't want to see if somebody has to leave or something happens to somebody and they can't do their work anymore, who's going to pick it up? Yeah, that was part of um, part of developing the process, mm-hmm. actually, um, so that all of all of the work on this, we can switch it not only between council staff, but also between um, plan team members mm-hmm. and the Pacific Island Fisheries Science Center. Mm-hmm. So developing a standard operating procedure yeah. for each of these, like if there's a lot of data that we're pulling together. Yeah. Um, I think that's that the key. And Josh, we talk about this a lot. Got to go back to this for a minute so people really sort of understand. I often, You and I have often talked about technology being both good and bad, but mostly in the respect of gathering information, it's pretty good. And a lot of us fishermen are buying into it, but it must be that the completion of these reports on a timely basis actually gives somebody something to measure. I don't know how often a fisherman measures something, uh, but... Certainly, uh, a fisherman with a mortgage measures whether he's making enough, catching enough fish or allowed to catch enough fish to pay his mortgage. So what do you see as the final, the, the end result of all these reports going forward as to, as to help us even more, particularly because of technology, to share the information and to act on it? I think a major thing for us is going to be to find out what we don't know, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. we the, the known knowns and the, the known unknowns mm-hmm. and the unknown unknowns, yeah. all, all that stuff. Um, for us, it's w- what, what are the gaps in, in our knowledge that we yeah. can identify and in the next year we can start targeting to try and fill some of those gaps. Um, we probably won't be able to get to all of them as quick sometimes, as we'd like some, to. Sometimes when you have to go upstairs and say, you know what, we've discovered a need here, but we're going to need somebody to come and do this. What are we going to do? Right, and th- yeah. that... That goes back to trying to fill that need Mm -hmm. with either resources Mm -hmm. or maybe a new method Mm -hmm. uh, of capturing that data. Yeah. You know, Asuka, real quickly on you, I I know that one of the things that happens in the longline fishery, which we talked about earlier, is that there's an observer program. And this is unique in, in in many parts of many fisheries. How valuable is it that these people are on these things? And I'm not saying keeping people honest, but I'm saying just reporting, just giving enough. You never know when an observer is going to be on your boat, right? You got to go. Unless it's a, a, as you told me, a sword fishing boat, then they always have them. But how good is that stuff with the kind of work that you do to identify, okay, this is what we expected and this is what happens on these trips? Yeah, it's it's vital. Mm-hmm. It, it's critical to the monitoring of the longline fishery, especially since, you know, we have these sea turtle measures, seabird mm-hmm. measures, and we need to know if those are still effective. And so we can mm-hmm. track over time. Are those numbers still low? Yeah. Are they going up? If they're going up, why are they going up? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, without that observer data constantly coming in and coming in at that same amount of level or, you know, with good coverage, yeah, yeah. We can't do that. We can't monitor that on a near real-time basis. And so it it, it certainly helps with keeping the fishery transparent mm -hmm. and the management transparent um, and and, and continuing um, to adapt that management so we can do better. Yeah, you know, because I I often talk about uh, we, we do a lot of stuff on Wicked Tuna North and South and Outer Banks and all of this stuff. And they have this thing that comes down like a guillotine. When it's finally, boom, it's over. And they know that. They expect it. They work with it. They live with it. Aren't we sort of developing, or don't we need to develop sort of the same thing here? If we find out that, and we've talked about this before real quickly, we could do a whole program on the green sea turtle, but it used to be part of our diet. And there's a lot of people that want to start eating them again. And it may be happening in the in the not too distant future, but it looks like that's one that's come back, but not quite enough where science is going to say, okay, we can start eating these guys again or taking them. Yeah, that's a, a little bit of a different issue. But mm. yeah, even, you know, if hypothetically, if we were able to go in that direction, again, that monitoring yeah. and that enforcement, the data collection, all of that is going to be important for the management. Yeah. Otherwise, you can't do a loosey-goosey management. Um, and so yeah, yeah, good point. And, and so it's with any kind of fishery resource or any, you know, resource that you're going to take out and to use um, for the benefit of the people, you want to have those components, the data collection, the monitoring, yeah. the enforcement um and that you can carry across to different sectors okay so josh i know we're not going to grade everybody today with a b c and d but obviously this is a great time of the year it's thanksgiving week we're giving thanks a lot it must be that the the sense of accomplishment in in the council is running high because 
these guys all have a task to do, they have a deadline to meet, and they, they're meeting their deadlines. Yeah, th- this this annual report for this year was a big thing. Mm-hmm. It was a big product that came out of a big meeting, and it took a lot of work by a lot of people, not mm-hmm. just not just the people here, but um, our partners in the National Marine Fishery Service, sure. as well as the state of Hawaii and the, the other um, island agency fishery departments. But um, just to have something on paper, especially for coral reef fisheries, which yeah. we've we've been lacking um since since we started working on on coral reef fisheries basically um to have something in hand to go look this is what what's happening with with your fishery yeah i think that's great well i certainly want to remind everybody once again uh that this being thanksgiving weekend also means that we give thanks to uh, to these folks so uh just to reintroduce our group and let you know who you've been listening to becky walker is a fisheries analyst uh and she's dealing with uh, habitat and marine planning. Marlo Saboter, uh, marine uh, ecosystem scientist. Malloy's been here now six, six years. Wow. Just like yesterday. And Asuka uh, Ishizaki. Thank you, Asuka. And Josh, you too. Thanks, everybody. And if you want to know more, you go to WPConsul.org. That's WPConsul.org. It's all there. And we'll see you next time for Go Fish. Have a happy Thanksgiving weekend, everybody. See you next time. Aloha. <laughs>